Okay. Today we're in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, uh, reading from the New King James Version. And last time we continued through chapter 3 as we looked a lot at darkness versus light and how to keep from being deceived. Went over some, some good points there. Um, you can take a look at the, uh, the Facebook group for that message if you, if you missed it. Um, I thought there was some good stuff in there. <laughs> Today we'll start in verse 22 and read through the end of the chapter for our text and uh, find out if there's uh, going to be a growing competition here between John the Baptizer and Jesus Christ or if it's going to be a cooperative effort. So it's, gonna, it's very interesting uh, what, what occurs in this chapter. So the Gospel of John chapter 3 verses 22 to 36. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John was also baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. Verse 25. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John, this was his disciples, came to John and said, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all men are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands near him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies. And no one receives his testimony. He who has received his, his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. John is starting to sound a lot like Jesus, isn't he? <laughs> his his uh, responses and his teaching. Now, Jesus and his disciples had now moved on into Judea in the ministry. This, of course, as we see, is where John was baptizing. People kept coming to John and being baptized as he was there. And um, I, th I find it interesting. We're, we're giving two more locations here, Anon and Salim, which are near the Jordan River. If you go from the Sea of Galilee southward, it's almost halfway down to the Dead Sea. And, you know, I, I just find this, the, the historical records and geographical records that we have are, are fascinating because instead of John just telling us that he was baptizing in Anon, he adds near Salim. Now that's be, because Anon is not a place that's maintained a population over the centuries. You don't find that on a map of Israel today. Um, and they know where it was at now, but the archaeologists haven't excavated the area. However, the area of Salim, or Salem as we would call it now in, in English or in America, it's well known. In fact, that whole area, there are lots and lots of pools of water there. There are even fisheries. If you look on a map of, of that area, you see there's fisheries, there's uh, you know, industries that have grown up around there, many ponds, many pools. Um, I don't know if you'd call them lakes. They're not like huge you know, lakes. And all around that, the whole area surrounding it was desert. So this little place just had all this water. And so it's almost a no-brainer why John was baptizing there, because there was much water. <clears throat> It's like a, a pastor I knew uh, had moved from, had gone to several different churches to pastor, and there was one church that uh, he asked specifically, he said, you know, I'd like to stay here. I'd like to be able to stay here longer. And, uh, you know, rather than moving along, and he said, I, I know it's going to be more work for me. He had, he had developed a couple of years of sermons, <laughs> and after a couple of years, 
they moved him somewhere else, and so he'd use the same sermons, but he, he knew it was going to be more work. And, and someone asked him one time, and he ended up being at that same, that last church for decades. And, you know, literally thousands, tens of thousands of people came to Christ in that place. And someone said, well, what gave you the wisdom? What gave you the inspiration to, to stay in that place? To, to, how did you know that was going to be the place? I mean, it was a little country church outside of any towns or anything. And um, he said, it was near the beach. <laughs> and I liked the water. <laughs> so, so he also, this was, that was Pastor Chuck Smith of Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, California. And uh, his, his answer, basically his response why are you? Why did you minister there? It's the same as John's was here because there was much water there. So I just thought that was interesting. But the thing about this, you know, Anon near Salim or near Salem area, um, gives us our first life lesson, and that is that we can trust the Bible in the historical and geographical details, and we can trust it with our lives. We can trust the Bible in historical and geographical details, and we can trust it with our lives. Now, next, the writer clarifies the, the time frame when this was with a spoiler in the story. You know, John does these spoilers throughout his, his gospel, and he mentioned that John had not yet been thrown in prison. And we know later he's killed, basically because of a rash promise made by King Herod to an exotic dancer. Um, crazy things happen sometimes. But even though he is first mentioned by name in the New Testament, John the baptizer could be considered to be the last of the Old Testament prophets. So ever since we were introduced to, to John, or John the Immerser, as some like to say as well, we see that he was focused on one thing, and that is getting God's message about the Messiah out to the people. We see almost every prophet in this uh, has the same drive inside to tell people God's message, no matter what the cost is. And the cost for many of them was high. The, the prophet that Jesus quoted the most, Isaiah, is said to have been uh, being chased by the king, uh, King Manasseh in Judah, had a lot of persecution, and finally ended up hiding in a hollow tree. And the king, they found out that he was there, and they had the tree cut down with Isaiah inside. And we see in Hebrews where the scripture mentioned, you know, that some of those leaders of the faith, faithful men, were sawn asunder, and they believe that's a reference to Isaiah. Jeremiah was impri imprisoned by the head priest. He dared preach against idolatry. And you know where he did it? He did it in the courts of the temple of God, preaching against idolatry. And they put him in prison, and then they released him the next day. And when he got out, he continued to preach to people, telling them to, they, they needed to improve their morality was terrible and they needed to improve that. They needed to get right with God. And a lot of the priests that were there and even some of the prophets, I would say false prophets that were there, demanded that he be put to death. So they took him up to trial there. He, the, the elders were in on that and the priests, they heard the matter and they let him go. But similarly, they continued to persecute Jeremiah, and uh, he was actually kidnapped several times. Last time he was taken to Egypt as a hostage, and even in Egypt, he continued to, to tell people there's coming destruction if you don't repent and turn to God. And the last information we have is that he was stoned to death by his fellow countrymen in Egypt, and he was buried there. You know, this prophet thing, this preaching God's message is not a safe thing to do when you're being open and honest and, and doing what God is asking you to do. There are a couple of traditions on Ezekiel's death, but both of them say that uh, he was killed by his own Israelites, his fellow countrymen. One says that when they were exiled, we know he was exiled to Babylonia. Um, one of them says that one of the leaders executed him after he was preaching to him against telling him you shouldn't be worshiping idols and the guy didn't like it and so he killed him. Um, the other one says he was killed by uh, a fellow countryman because he had, um, you know, the countryman said he had cursed his flocks and his, his children. Well, we know if someone is doing wrong that that's just the natural result is, is that things don't work well for you. So 
uh, Amos, another prophet, he was tortured by Amaziah, a priest, a priest, a religious leader of Bethel. And then uh, Amaziah's son smacked him, he hit him with a club and gave him a mortal injury and he ended up going home, but he died at home a few days later. Now these and many, many other true prophets of Yahweh knew of the dangers of presenting God's warning to people who had rebelled against God, yet they continued to preach. In 2 Chronicles 24, we read the account of what happened to Zechariah. Now, I know this is a bit of a rabbit trail, but I think it's really important to see what's happening with, with John. We read in, uh, in Zechariah, but there's a little background. Just, uh, jot this down, I've got a little homework for you. 2 Chronicles 22 through 24, check out this whole story. But the long story short is that uh, Joash, became king when he was seven years old. Oh, I always thought that was interesting. They got a seven-year-old king. And he followed a very wicked king. And um, the young Joash was greatly supported by a priest named Jehoiada. Uh, and together they worked. They restored the temple. Uh, Joash followed the, the Lord for many, many years until Jehoiada passed away. Uh, I guess they were kind of like best buds. But after he passed away, his heart changed. He started listening to the, some of the evil leaders and that had turned away from God. And so Joash started allowing and, and even practice great evil in the kingdom of God there. I mean, the kingdom of, of uh, Judah. This was in, in, in Judah. And a lot of bad things began to happen. And God sent a, many prophets to Joash to warn him, but he didn't listen. Finally, God sent the son of the priest that had helped King Joash for many years, thinking, you know, and I, I, the thought, thought process, I know God knew what was gonna happen, but it was like, you know, we've heard this. They'll, they didn't listen to my, my messengers, maybe they'll listen to my son. So we see this event, and this is in 2 Chronicles 24, 20 to 23. It says, then the spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, who stood above the people and said to them, Thus says God, why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord so you cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, he has also forsaken you. So they conspired against him. And at the command of the king, Joash, they stoned him with stones in the court of the house of the Lord. Thus Joash the king did not remember the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but killed his son. And as he died, he said, the Lord look on it and repay. And so it happened in the spring of the year that the army of Syria came up against him and they came to Judah in Jerusalem and destroyed all the leaders from among the people and sent all their spoil to the king of Damascus. Does that sound vaguely familiar to you? The father did wonderful and marvelous things for people. And yet when they didn't see him anymore, the people turned against all that he had stood for turned against God. Things went downhill. God even sent messengers to warn the people and they despised his messengers. Finally, the father's own son was sent and they killed him. And soon, those who ignored the warnings, they were destroyed. That's a very, very sad situation indeed. But that cycle we saw repeat multiple times. Now the prophets I've been talking about and many more boldly proclaim God's message, despite the cost. John was no exception. We hear more of his last message here in the, the Gospel of John as we continue. But our life lesson here is that just like all the true prophets leading up to Christ, we as believers must boldly proclaim God's message to our generation, no matter what the cost. Just like the true prophets leading up to Christ, we must boldly proclaim God's message to our generation, no matter what the cost. So let's see what happened next in our text. Verse 25, there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. Now, we don't know exactly what the discussions were between John's disciples and, and the Jews. And we observed earlier that baptism, literally immersion, was a Jewish ritual of ceremonial purification. In the context of John and Jesus baptizing, 
The immersion was not the usual cleaning of the body for sanitary purposes. It was symbolic of the repentance, turning away from sin, washing away the old sinful life as they prepared for the kingdom of God. We don't know, maybe the Jews were arguing that they were doing it wrong or only certain people were supposed to pour, perform this immersion ceremony or who knows. But we do know that Jesus was preaching the gospel in this same area as well. And his disciples were also baptizing people as they repented of their sins. And, and technically, those who came in repentance were not being personally baptized by Jesus. Um, in the next chapter, we see in verse 2, it says, though Jesus, did not him, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples. So when we talk about Jesus baptizing, it was his disciples who baptizing on his behalf. And what I find interesting here is that Jesus could have baptized his followers. There's no reason that he couldn't have done that, but he didn't. Instead, he was training his disciples to do the work of the ministry, allowing them to baptize the new followers. What a blessing it must have been for his disciples themselves, obviously new in the ministry, to be allowed the privilege of baptizing new followers as they repented of their sins and seeing their life changing. So I think this is a life lesson for all of us again. Jesus blesses those who are willing to serve him by involving them in changing the lives of others. Jesus blesses those who are willing to serve him by involving them in changing the lives of others. Now, it's likely uh, from the other records we have in the other gospels that Jesus and his disciples were in this region for several months. John had already testified that he was the, he was the Messiah. There's a, quite a bit of momentum and excitement in the, for the ministry. And um, we don't know. Again, the religious leaders may have been jealous that the people were going out to this itinerant preacher uh, to receive religious instruction um, and, and even the rituals rather than coming to them. We, we're not sure. We, we saw earlier that when they seemed to question them about this, they didn't really get anywhere with it. So, you know, I kind of wondered maybe they were taking on a divide and conquer strategy because we see uh, what happens in the next verse and I can, I can just imagine them coming to John's disciples and saying something like this. Uh, you know, your rabbi John over here, he's been out here preaching for a few years now. And, and that new guy, Jesus, he's over there and he's trying to take your followers away. Can you imagine that happening? I, from, the, from the response of, of John's disciples, you know, I think that's a very, po very strong possibility. You know, they're saying, probably said he's preaching repentance about the kingdom, just like you are. He's even baptizing people too. And, and now look how many are going to him now. There's more people going to him than going to you. That's just not fair. Well, whatever it is, they found a few of John's disciples at least that got a bit riled up about it, enough that they went back and wanted to talk to John about this new guy and what they should do about it. So in verse 26, I'm going to read from the Amplified it says, so they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, teacher, the man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan at the Jordan River crossing and to whom you testified, look, he is baptizing too and everyone's going to him. So again, just a, a slight note here, uh, geographical accuracy. It was a Anon and Selim are on the west bank of the Jordan River. Jesus was baptized on the east bank on the east side of the Jordan. So it was on the other side of the river. Just a little ge geographical accuracy here. But to their surprise, when they just see disciples, they thought, oh, well, John's gonna tell us what to do and how to, how to build our ministry or how to keep Jesus from baptizing so many people over there. But John isn't upset that his followers were dwindling while Jesus was attracting big, bigger crowds. But instead in verse 27, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from, his he from heaven. Now, what a great response. You know, I, I, I love to see ministries cooperating in a way that, uh, you know, when, when, they're, when a man has a pastor of a church, people leave his church and go to another church. And uh, I, I do have a pastor that has said this, and it's like, praise God, if that's where God's leading them, that's where they need to be. But you don't find a lot of those. <laughs> you know, a lot of times it's, well, what are they, what'd they leave me for? But um, his response is, basically, it's not my ministry. All of it is from God above. I have nothing except what comes from the Lord. 
our life lesson here is that everything that we have been given has been given to us by God. Everything that we have has been given to us by God. And John gives an explanation that I don't even think his own disciples saw coming or, or, or expected. Verse 28, you yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who is the bridegroom, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears them, he rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. Here John reminds them that Jesus is the one that the ministry is all about. He gently reminds them that, yes, they heard him plainly say, they, they said that man that you saw was the Messiah, he said, yeah, you heard me say that. He's the one, not me. They heard him plainly say it. John makes it clear again that Christ's mission is the primary mission. John's entire ministry was a forerunner and a support person to, to be sure people knew that Jesus was coming. Seeing Jesus succeed and gaining more followers made John happy. It made him extremely happy. Rather than being selfish and taking credit for the blessings that God gave him, we see that John rejoiced to see the blessings God gave him. We saw he rejoiced to see his obedience caused more and more people to go to Jesus, to go away from him and go to Jesus. They believed in Jesus. They gave glory to God. And this was, this is, he said this is what fulfills his joy. And I love what it says in the Amplified Bible. It says, then this is my pleasure and joy, and it is now complete. Now, you know, this isn't just a, a Chick-fil-A cashier saying a scripted, my pleasure, when refilling your drink, okay? This was the expression of the accomplishment of a lifelong God-given mission empowered by God's Holy Spirit in John the Baptizer. You know, and John probably explained these things to his disciples before, told them what was going to happen, you know, explained to them, um, you know, how this would all happen, but probably didn't quite sink in until it was actually happening. And now he was simply, how he was simply paving the road for the Messiah. Once his followers got riled up, they, they thought they might lose their ministry. <laughs> you ever think you're going to lose something? And God just taps you on the shoulder and reminds you, it's not yours. That's what was happening to these, these disciples. And, and finally, their hearts had been readied for John's explanation and began to catch on. Now, I'll reread the remaining verses in the Amplified. After wetting my whistle here. <laughs> uh, verses 30 to 31 say, He must increase, but I must decrease. He must grow more prominent. I must grow less so. He who comes from above heaven is far above the others. He who comes from the earth, speaking of himself, belongs to the earth and talks the language of the earth. His words are from an earthly standpoint. But he who comes from heaven, he's talking of Jesus, is far above all others, far superior to all others in prominence and excellence. Here John is giving a vivid contrast between him and Jesus. <clears throat> He's verifying the things that we explored earlier in our studies. First and foremost, John is um, acknowledging how inferior he is to Jesus. It's not a false humility, you know, or beating himself up. He's just simply telling it like it is. And he's telling his disciples how much more important it is that people follow Jesus and not himself. There's no competition here. There's a natural flow. John has prepared the way of the Lord. He proclaimed the Messiah coming. He called the people to repentance. He's baptizing for them to show others they're turning away from their sins. And more recently, he identified the Messiah and became, <clears throat> began proclaiming, in fact, that Jesus is the promised one of God that was predicted by all of the prophets before him. He's already predicted Christ's sacrificial death and that a sacrifice would replace the old system of forgiveness of sins. I mean, replace the old system of covering sins by the blood of innocent animals and replace it with forgiveness of sins and that, taking it away because he had said told when Jesus came he said behold the lamb of God the final sacrifice of God who takes away the sin of the world now after after doing all this he's now explaining how Jesus is in fact divine 
He's so far superior to any earthly authority that there can be no comparison. And now it continues in verse 32. It is to what he has actually seen and heard that he bears testimony. And yet no one accepts his testimony. Nobody receives his evidence as true. So John continues with what Jesus told Nicodemus earlier, that being divine and from heaven, Jesus is an eyewitness to the truth, truth from time and eternity. And John isn't literally saying that there's nobody accepting his testimony because we're seeing more and more disciples gain. It, it was just kind of a, a rhetorical uh, a statement because he's astonished that relatively few of those who are supposed to be studying the scriptures are actually accepting and believing his eyewitness testimony. So it's not like nobody ever <laughs> is coming to him, <clears throat> but he's saying, you know, they're not, they're not, they're not listening to him. Just like Isaiah 51, 3 talked about. Who has believed, <coughs> I'm sorry, 53, 1. It says, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And then it goes on and describes Jesus. Now, for some extra credit for your homework, okay? Maybe we'll grade you next week. Uh, read the whole chapter of Isaiah 53 again. And this time of year is a great time to do it as, as the world around us is looking to Christ and, and him coming, Isaiah 53 tells about this in a little different perspective than, than that of a little baby in a manger. It talks about why Christ came and, and that's the, the real reason that we, we want to uh, encourage uh, others to follow him. But read that, you'll find out exactly what John is getting to here. I'm sure that much of that chapter probably flashed through the minds of those uh, scholars that were listening to him when he was telling this. Um, we're not sure how many of the, the people that were following were scholarly, but uh, we know there are some. But uh, this gives us an opportunity to study out uh, as we consider these things. Uh, John, of course, John didn't get bogged down in all of these, these uh, rabbit trails <laughs> in his studies as I'm doing, but um, he jumped right ahead of those who were rejecting. He didn't dwell on that. He just mentioned it. Those who were rejecting, refusing the message. You see, John's prophetic ministry was not primarily about judgment coming or doom or impending judgment that we see is really happening in a lot of the, uh, the other Old Testament prophets. But John's message was one of hope. He was proclaiming the hope that God had promised from the very beginning of man's fall. When mankind fell, disobeyed God, sinned against God, God had to let the consequences of, of that sin occur, but he also gave a ray of hope, and this is the fulfillment of it. John is now understanding the whole picture. He's trying to paint it for his disciples and for all who will listen to him. <clears throat> In verse 33 through 36, what he says is, whoever receives his testimony has set the seal of approval to this. God is true. That man is definitely certified, acknowledged, declared once and for all, and is himself assured that it is divine truth that God cannot lie. For since he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, proclaims God's own message, God does not give him his spirit sparingly or by measure, but boundless is the gift of God that God makes of his spirit. The father loves the son and has given, has entrusted and committed everything into his hand, and he who believes in, has faith in, clings to, relies on the Son, now possesses eternal life. But whoever disobeys, is unbelieving toward, refuses to trust in, disregards, is not subject to the Son, will never see and experience life. But instead, the wrath of God abides on him. God's displeasure remains on him. His indignation hangs over him continuously. So John doesn't totally avoid the consequences of disobedience, but he emphasizes the gifts that God gives. And uh, with I, re, this is one of the reasons I, I like the Amplified. There in, uh, in verse 34, it talks about uh, God does not give, his holy, give him his spirit sparingly or by measure, doesn't give by measure. And that was a little ambiguous, but the, the implication is that it's boundless is the gift that God gives of his spirit. Now, John the baptizer is quite excited about the results. Uh, what happens when people receive the Lord? In verse 33, 
He says the testimony that a person believes in Christ is openly putting a seal of approval and confirming that God is true, cannot lie. Verse 34 I just read, John's own experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit confirms the boundless generosity of joy and fulfillment in a life that's totally dedicated to God. Verse 35, our Heavenly Father completely trusts His Son, and that's very important, I think, to hurt here in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, to know that. He trusts Him with all truth, all wisdom, all power and authority. In verse 36, it talks about eternal life that's greater than any temporary life we have here in the flesh. And it's God's generous gift to those who will simply put their trust in the Son of God. And conversely, refuses to obey that, leaves the choice to leave that, condem that condemnation in place that mankind already has. Live a life displeasing to God, you are subject to the wrath of God against evil. He can't stand. God and evil cannot stand. It's like in this room, there are lights on. But if you turn, shut off all the windows, turn all the lights off, it would be darkness. God cannot coexist with darkness. God cannot coexist with evil. As soon as the light comes in this room, the darkness is gone. As soon as God comes, if you come in the presence of God, the evil has to go. I mean, it's just, it's just a natural, that's how it works. So we don't want to be in that place where we have zero chance to experience the true abundant life of Christ. We, that God planned for each one of us. We want to believe in his son. Yes, there is a competition going on between two different factions, as we talked about earlier. But it's not John versus Jesus. We see John preaching the same message as Jesus here. Literally pointing everyone to Jesus as a source of truth and life. The contrast is still light versus darkness. Good versus evil. God's spirit versus our own flesh. Uh-oh, got a little bit personal there, huh? <laughs> and eternal life versus eternal damnation. And the choice today, my friends, is yours. The choice is mine. Do we want to choose to start disputes and arguments with others who are working to bring the gospel of Christ into the world? Or are you going to focus on getting the word out to the world before it's too late? Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you to be, continue to be the light of the world. Look for the things we have in common with other workers working in ministry to bring more people to faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let your light shine. Let others clearly see that. And let them see that the fulfilling of the call God has on your life, how it can bring you joy. Let the Holy Spirit fill your life with joy and bring glory to God the Father and our Heavenly Father. He will build our faith day by day as we trust in Him and as we let Him. It's been exciting to see how John, how, how God used John the baptizer and the amazing joy that came into his life even as he realized that his time to work, the ministry, was drawing to a close. Our life lesson here is, when you're following the call of God, led by the Holy Spirit, every day is an adventure. When you're following the call of God, led by the Holy Spirit, every day is an adventure. I love how the Gospel writer here lets us see a glimpse into the heart of a man who's been filled with the Holy Spirit from before he was born. A true miracle done by God. And it wasn't something that was commonly done as we studied before. Jesus talked about being born from above, being born again by the Spirit of God. And it's quite a while in, in his ministry before Jesus actually reveals that after he's gone, the Holy Spirit will be sent to everyone who asks. But incredibly blessed to have the Bible. We can turn to a different place in the Bible. We can, we can jump over to Luke and in Luke eleven thirteen, 13, see that Jesus says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? That's for you. That's for me. That's for today. That's for now. It's for those who trust and believe in Jesus, cling to him, rely on him. That belief, according to the Bible, in Jesus grants you the right to become a child of God. If you've asked Jesus to be your Savior, confess your sins, put your trust in him, you can ask God today and every day to fill you with his Holy Spirit to give you the power to do his work through you. If you've not already done so, you can be assured of eternal life in Christ by praying from your heart, confessing your sins, asking Jesus to forgive you. And you can even ask him today to fill you with his Holy Spirit to do his work and to empower your life 
for his will. And uh, I dare say that your joy will be filled, fulfilled as you do that. If you have any questions about your relationship with Jesus or there's anything else you'd like for us to pray with you about, please don't hesitate to ask Mitzi or myself as we finish up our fellowship today. Uh, next week, we're going to study about a, a twist in the, in the ministry of Jesus that nobody, even, not even including his disciples, saw coming. And uh, so that'll be an interesting as we start time as we start John chapter 4. At this time, I'd like to pray a blessing over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. God bless you.